Ever since the Garden of Eden was first conceived by man, the idea of an earthly paradise has been reimagined again and again throughout the ages to give humans hope that one day, if the right conditions are met, we can at last end suffering once and for all and re-enter the garden. One could argue for the existence of an eternal paradise in the metaphysical realm, a place we go to after we die or perhaps we've been to before we were born, perhaps it exists in another dimension. However, if such a Garden of Eden could be attained on Earth, what would be the sufficient price of entry for this utopia? Considering the payoff is an end to suffering in perpetuity, technically, any price is worth paying, even if the price is more human suffering. In this video, I'm going to tell you about a young Chinese man in 19th century China whose belief that he was the brother of Jesus Christ ultimately led to the deaths of up to 20 million people. Why you've never heard of the story is beyond me. Strap yourselves in. The first elements of utopian idealism that I'm aware of to spring out of China were from a Taoist cult called the Way of Supreme Peace in the 3rd century AD. You may remember this cult from my videos on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms as being the cult ultimately responsible for the collapse of the Han Dynasty and up to 7 million deaths in the pursuit of its grand vision. The cult believed that a supreme being would descend to earth and end human history as we know it and institute a great peace, or as it's called in Chinese, Taiping. Another one in the 13th century named the White Lotus Society believed in the imminent reincarnation of another Buddha who was foretold to gather all her children at the millennium into one family and institute a great peace. They led an uprising called the Red Turban Rebellion, and the resulting upheaval led to the collapse of the Mongolic Yuan Dynasty. They too believed in a coming period of great peace. Those are only two of the countless mystic secret society sects that have sprung up in China, and this pattern of Taiping, great peace cults with the utopian visions of a perfect world springing up throughout China would play an instrumental role throughout the country's long history. It's time now to get into the story. This video is based on a book by a Chinese historian, Jonathan D. Spencer's book, God's Chinese Son, which explains in detail the period of China in the 19th century known as the Taiping Rebellion and the dramatic rise and fall of its charismatic prophet, Hong Shou Chuan. All the information presented here comes from a variety of sources, but most notably from the archived Taiping written records itself. These are my findings. Originally named Hong Huo Shou, he was born in the 1st of January 1814 in Hua County in Guangzhou Province, at the time known as Canton. His Hakka ancestors originally immigrated there from the northeast when Hua became a newly created county when the Manchus took power. These Hakka people are originally Han people from the central plains who migrated south to flee from the waves of successive barbarian invasions from the north dating back to the 5th century. Despite settling in southern China such a long time ago, the immigrant status never left them, as the name Hakka in Chinese translates to guest people. Despite looking the same and sharing mostly the same culture, the biggest difference between Hakka and other Han families is that the women don't bind their feet. For the Han Chinese men of that era, this was a huge turnoff, and as such, Hakka people only intermarried, furthering the cultural differences between the two groups. Just imagine dating a girl who didn't have bound feet. Gross. Just imagine taking it back to meet your mom. I have one question for you. Yeah? What are those? <laughs> Having high hopes that their son would one day pass the civil service examinations and elevate the family out of peasanthood, they made financial sacrifices for him to get a formal Confucian-based education. And after failing the examination the first time around, Hong returns to do the examination again at the age of 22 in 1836. Going to the examination halls, he sees two strange men, one Cantonese and another who's a foreigner. 
completely alien to the average person back then, a foreigner was a true oddity in these increasingly strange times. They looked completely different, spoke an unintelligible language, and came from a place that didn't exist on any known map, and overnight, they simply appeared from the endless expanse of sea to trade. Unbeknownst to the locals at the time, there were two kinds of foreigners that appeared in the streets of Canton at that time. The first was the profiteer, whose motives could easily be understood by the locals. After all, they do the same thing. But then there was the more mysterious variety that showed up, and these were the missionaries. Among the first Chinese converts was a man named Liang Afa, who studying under the missionaries of Canton led to the creation of the first Chinese Christian work called Good Words for Exhorting the Age. Far from being a translation of the Bible though, it was made of religious tracts, as they were called, and were simply translations of well-known motifs in the Bible, from Noah's flood to the birth of Jesus. They were rather simplified text, but such a document was a technological breakthrough at the time, the first meaningful bridge between these two unbelievably different cultures. Despite harassment from the authorities, the missionaries and their Chinese converts would go from town to town handing out these religious tracts for free, and they sold like hotcakes. Many of them, hearing of a friend of a friend who had received a book from these strange foreigners, thronged to the missionaries to hear what wisdom they had to offer. Hong Shou Chuan, on his way to do his examination, happened to be one of them. Originally taking a superficial glance at the writings, he takes note of some peculiar coincidences written in some of the tracts. For example, he pays special attention to the story of Noah's flood because within that story lies a clue that will be stored in Hong's mind. He takes note of the character Hong, which means flood in Chinese, referring to the great flood that was sent by God to cleanse the world of sin. His name is also Hong. Furthermore, God's name is transliterated in the book as Ye Huo Hua. This is the same Huo that he has in his own name, meaning that this God, Jehovah, and him share the same name. He would then note how God used fire, Huo, the same Huo used in Hong's own surname, to destroy the sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah who had angered God by their lust and immorality. Hong would go to take his examination as planned, but unfortunately he was again unsuccessful. The imperial examination was a notoriously difficult exam with only a tiny fraction of participants even qualifying to take the exam in the first place. To be able to pass it, your parents would have had to have made great financial sacrifices to hire a tutor to teach you from a young age in memorizing all the great classics of Confucian thinking for about two decades. And the stakes were very high. Hundreds of generations of peasantry could be undone in one generation if you were able to pass this examination. You would be able to land a secure post as a bureaucratic official with a relatively high and secure income. You'd be able to have some power on the local level and be afforded the dignity allowed to those only for the gentry class. By passing this examination, you can secure the security of your family for generations to come, and for Hong, Failing at this historic crossroads would have been devastating for him. Taking the exams were expensive. He may even need further tutoring, and chancing upon more money to take the exams again would take a long time. Quoting Hong, Oh my parents, how badly I have returned that favor of your love to me. I shall never attain a name that may reflect its luster upon you. Arriving home, he becomes very sick most likely as a result of going through a nervous breakdown and is stuck in bed with a high fever. His family crowd around him thinking that Hong may die at any moment. His fever gets worse and worse and as he lay there on the brink of death, delirium takes him over and the swirling fragments of his consciousness coalesce into a vision. There is a tiger, there is a dragon, there is children playing in yellow robes and now he's in a sedan chair being taken towards the east. The people accompanying him look welcoming and are bathed in wine. They stop the sedan and slit him open like fiends from hell, but to Hong, this doesn't feel like torment, for it occurs to him that they only remove the soiled mass within him, and they then replace it with new organs. He is then greeted by a woman, 
refers to him as son. She says, your body is soiled from your descent into the world. Let me cleanse you in the river, after which time you can go to see your father, wearing a black dragon robe. His father is very tall and has a golden beard reaching down to his waist. Quote, so you have come back. Pay close attention to what I say. Many of those on earth have lost their original nature. Which of those people on earth did I not give life to and succor? Which of them did not eat my food and wear my clothing? Which of them has not received my blessing? Have they no scrap of respect or fear for me? He continues. It is the demon devils who have led them astray. The people dissipate in offerings to the demon devils, things that I have bestowed upon them, as if it was the demon devils that had given life to them and nourished them. People have no inkling as to how these demon devils will snare and destroy them, nor can they understand the extent of my anger and pity. Angered by his father's grief, Hong offers to start at once to enlighten the people about these demon devils, but his father explains to him that doing so would be very hard. He tells Hong of the myriad of ways that demon devils manipulate and harm people on earth. Hong asks his father why he doesn't simply destroy the demon devils once and for all. His father responds, because the demon devils not only fill the world, they have forced their way even into the 33 layers of heaven itself. Your power is so vast, says Hong, that you can give life to those you want to have life and death to those who you think you should die. Why then allow them to force their way in here? Let them do their evil a little longer. They shall not escape my wrath, replies the father. Hong tells his father though, that if they keep on waiting, those he loves on earth are only going to suffer more. His father agrees with him and says, if you find the evil intolerable, then you may act. Hong watches the demons carefully and sees that the leader is Yan Luo, the king of hell in Chinese mythology and who people call the dragon demon of the East Sea. Hong begs his father for permission to do battle with Yan Luo and this time his father acquiesces. To help him on his quest, his father gives him a great flaming sword called Snow in the Clouds. With his great sword, Hong goes to war with the demon devils, and up they fight through the 33 levels of heaven. Hong is accompanied by his elder brother, whose weapon is a golden seal, which he uses to blind the demons while Hong uses his great sword to cut them down. Devious is Yen Lo, who is capable of endless transformations. In his fight with Hong, he morphs into a great serpent, then he is a flea on the back of a dog, now he is a flock of birds, and then he turns into a lion. He is losing though, and is pushed down through the levels of heaven with his demon devils till at last he is ousted entirely from heaven and they fall down to earth itself. Hong, along with his celestial army, go to earth and behead a great number of demon devils till at last they have captured Yan Lo. About to behead the king of hell himself, his father intervenes and tells him to let him go for killing him would pollute the heavens and his guise as a serpent would allow him to mislead the people there and eat their souls. With the great battle over, Hong rests in heaven, living many lifetimes there. He settles in the palace in the eastern reaches of heaven with his wife, the first chief of the moon. There they have a son together, but it's no time to rest. His father must assist Hong in his transformation, so Hong studies moral texts under his father. His father is patient with him despite his slow progress, but his elder brother less so and often gets furious at Hong for slacking off. Despite the endless passage of time in heaven, Hong's father won't let him forget about the world below and tells him that it's finally time for him to go back. The demons are still strong there, he says, and the people debauched. Without Hong, how will they be transformed? Hong's father then tells him to change his earthly name by removing Huo as it is taboo to share the same name and instead use the name Chuan, completeness. And thus he changes his name to Hong Shou Chuan. Now, before we compartmentalize such a strange vision as simply a crazy dream, right off anyone who believes it is crazy, I want to note that all religions have as part of their founding mythology a great vision of sorts. These visions tend to have something in common. For instance, Benny Shannon, professor of Jerusalem's Hebrew University, 
where he used to head the psychology department, suggested that Moses' burning bush revelation was in fact a psychedelic experience caused by the burning of the acacia plant. The potent drug ayahuasca is made from the leaves of the acacia plant and is noted as leaving recipients with a profound and life-altering psychedelic experience. This acacia plant was frequently used in the Sinai Peninsula during the time of the wandering Hebrews, with the wood itself being used to build the sacred tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant itself. This ayahuasca produces a chemical in the brain called dimethyltryptamine, also known as DMT, which is in fact a naturally occurring chemical in the brain. Your brain actually produces this DMT drug naturally in your pineal gland, which is known in the Dharmic spiritual tradition as your third eye. This DMT is naturally released in large amounts during two key events in your life, when you're born and when you die. When people are close to death, their brains release massive amounts of DMT, resulting in what most people experience as a near-death experience, which can ultimately be explained as a psychedelic experience of a deeply spiritual nature where people report either going to hell or going to heaven before they return to their body. What I'm trying to say is that Hong's near-death experience was a psychedelic experience, and like the visions of the great prophets of old, he saw profound things that would ultimately alter the course of his life and those around him. Leaving behind his family in heaven, including his wife and child, he returns to his body with fits of loud screams. He screams to all those around him, SLASH THE DEMONS! SLASH THE DEMONS! And then he gets up out of his bed and runs around screaming battle cries and swinging his arms as if he was attacking something with a sword. Hong is given a few days to recover, but it is clear to those around him that Hong has become a completely different person. He put in his door a placard that read, Heavenly King, Lord of the Kingly Way, which is a title he apparently received in heaven. He then introduces his new name to his family, Hong Shou Chuan, which isn't so strange, but he would then rant about his duties to separate the demon devils from the virtuous. Pretty strange dinner conversation. Considered to have gone mad, his family lock him in his room, guarded by his brothers until he recovers his senses, and with the passage of time, him and his family reach compromise, and they slowly adjust to his new personality while he settles down and stops ranting about heavenly things. Life slowly returns back to normal for Hong, and he starts teaching at a nearby school while preparing for another attempt at the Imperial Examinations. Seven years have now passed since he had his visions, and despite outwardly living a normal life with his work and family obligations, his visions have deeply impacted his psyche and have totally etched themselves into his character. Although his life is completely altered, his vision still lacks any explanation. Li Jin Feng, a distant relative of Hong, comes to visit one day and sitting on the mantle, he sees an odd book belonging to him. Opening it up, he's amazed with its contents. It's Liang Afar's religious tracts. Hong is also told Li of his strange vision, and when Li picks up the book, he urges Hong to read it again. Now to tell this whole story, I need to give more details about the context surrounding this time. Just as Hong is reading the religious tracts again, the first opium war has just started. The British are unmatched in military superiority, but despite this, patriotic citizens muster a militia of 20,000 soldiers to fight them. But just on the eve of battle, the Qing sign a diplomatic truce with the British and cede over the island of Hong Kong and Canton City. In addition, the Qing side agrees to pay 6 million taels of silver to the British. This humiliation would be felt viscerally in the examination halls, as the scholars would hurl their inkstones at the officials they have come to hate. As a result of the conclusion of the Opium War, there was a growing belief in the country that it was full of traitors. Traitors to the Chinese race. The enraged militia is dispersed by the authorities, but it does little to calm them down and the militia go on a witch hunt after anyone who is thought to be collaborating with the British, resulting in a thousand deaths of their own fellow villagers to mindless bloodshed. The resentment would be felt even by the regular army, who did little fighting during the actual conflict, 
but in the conclusion of the Opium War would roam the countryside accusing villagers of being traitors and looting their valuables. They were no better during the actual fighting either however. Despite the British attacking Shanghai and besieging Nanjing, the Manchu officers launched preemptive attacks on their own people on vague treason charges, massacring many. Upon victory, British troops would enter the town and see piled up corpses of villagers killed by the Manchu officers. Many of the dispossessed would ironically flee to the British to aid them in their fight against the Qing, further fanning suspicion that Qing had about the loyalty of the locals. Those that don't turn to the British flock to the secret societies, and through blood oaths and secret codes of communication, these secret societies would pledge themselves to overthrow the Qing and restore the ethnic Han Chinese Ming Dynasty, which was defeated 200 years ago by the Qing. So with the Qing being unable to maintain its own sovereignty from a technologically superior nation and the corrupt armies doing nothing but tyrannizing the people, the seeds of dissent are sown, and resentment towards the already hated non-ethnic Chinese Qing dynasty becomes the powder keg only waiting for a spark. Calling out to Hong from Liang Afar's book are the apocalyptic words of Isaiah the prophet, quote, Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole heart is sick, the whole heart faint, from the sole of the foot and unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment, your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your present, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. There's a blinding truth about these words regarding the current state of 18th century China, and Hong sees it all too clearly. He continues reading the tracts, reading about the Garden of Eden and how humans originally lived in paradise. This utopia was apparently disrupted by a great serpent, a devil, a god of evil who corrupted the inhabitants, and as a result, the humans were sent away from the garden, guarded by an angel wielding a flaming sword. He then finally comes to the story of Jesus, and it is written that an angel came out to announce the birth of Jesus, and he cried out, Glory to God in the highest, and the earth, Taiping, and goodwill towards men. This fits with the passage where Liang explains the phrase Tian Guo, the heavenly kingdom, which describes the community of those who believe in Jesus and worship the Lord of heaven. Therefore, those who live in this Tian Guo by worshipping Jesus will be able to achieve Tai Ping. Finally, he reads Matthew 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Tian Guo. On Hong's 29th birthday, he comes back to Canton City to sit the imperial examination a fourth time, and despite two decades of rigorous Confucian education, he fails once more. Incensed by this absolute injustice, he turns to the words of Jesus once more. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but corrupt trees bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. It is now becoming more and more clear to Hong who the false prophets are based on the yields of their fruits. Scholars who prepare for the imperial examination by custom pay reverence and give offerings to two deities, Wen Chang and Kui Xing, the gods of literature. But despite this, many exam takers never succeed and many continue to try to pass the exam well into their 70s. Liang Afar would write, Haven't these men prayed to these idols every year? Why didn't they win the idols protection and pass successfully? From this we can see, these Confucian scholars are bewildered and obsessed by their ambitions, so they cling to their delusions and worship these idols, instead of with a humble mind worshipping the ruler of heaven and earth, the god who rules the entire world. Liang concludes, Which of us can be sure he will live to be 50 or 60, let alone 80 or 100? Hong absorbs this message, and decides to never again sit the exam. 
The Yang suggests that long ago, God chose one country to be his own, the land named Israel. There he gave the people the Ten Commandments and his own son to save all humans from sin. But because the Hebrews ignored the words of God, he exacted a terrible vengeance and the whole country was subjugated. As he writes, up to the present time, this country is no more and its people scattered among all the other nations. Such a fate, he concludes, awaits all unbelievers and all the world must expect a final judgment which will sweep upon the people as surely as the pains of a woman in labor, yet as furtively and unseen as a thief in the night. God's retainers will unroll the scrolls on which all our sins are listed. All people of all nations shall be judged as surely as the shepherd separates out the sheep from the mountain goats. To those who believe in Jesus and shelter the believers in his name will come the blessings of the Almighty God, but the others, there will only be eternal torment in the eternal fire, with the demons as their guardians. Suddenly, Hong is overwhelmed with an epiphany, and the key to everything has been unlocked. The man with the golden beard, his father, was none other than God the Father, Lord Jehovah who created heaven and earth. The elder brother who helped him slay the demons in heaven was Jesus Christ himself. All the people living there in heaven were the angels, and the text he just read were sacred teachings that God had forced him to learn during his time in heaven. The demon devil king, Yen Luo, the dragon of the East Sea, is in fact a devil serpent who caused humanity to fall into sin in the first place. The sword that God had given him in heaven to slay the demons was the same flaming sword that guarded the gate to the Garden of Eden. The raging flood that almost swept away all living things is a sign of Hong's own destiny. The cleansing rituals that Hong went through in heaven were foretellers of his baptism. There are legions of demons still to slay on earth, for evil has infiltrated all the human race. And since Jesus is the Son of God, and also Hong's elder brother, then Hong is literally God's Chinese son. Piecing together fragments of the baptismal ritual based on the incomplete text of Liang, Hong and his relative Li Jingfang go down to the river and baptize each other. With that done, they go to a craftsman and they have forged a double-edged sword that God had given Hong in heaven, and on that blade are written the characters, Sword for Exterminating Demons. Hong would write a poem about the sword. Grasping our three-foot swords, we bring order to the mountains and valleys. All within the four seas will be one family, living in kindly union. Tigers roar and dragons call. Light fills the earth. Great will be our joy. And Taiping, great peace, reigns. Most people think Hong has become insane. And as such, his parents hire a man to guard him in his room until he comes to his senses. But after days and days of being forced to listen to Hong's mad ranting, the man sent to guard Hong becomes Hong's first convert. With the guard refusing to keep this prophet locked away, Hong is unleashed on the public, then converting two of his relatives who were also disenfranchised scholars who failed their examinations. These two men are Feng Yunshan and Hong Rangan. And together, this trio pulls over Liang Yafar's tracts to find hidden gems of wisdom whilst preaching to all those around them. One by one, their relatives start to believe and are in turn converted. The trio then take literally the words to strike at the idols as commanded in the book of Deuteronomy, and they start a campaign of defacing Confucian temples and schools. His new radical behavior isn't without consequence though, and he is fired from his job as a school teacher and alienates many of his fellow villagers. The trio then embark on a mission to roam the countryside, preaching the doctrine of repentance, while selling brush and ink on their way to support themselves. Starting off in Canton City and making their way up to Qingyuan County, they find that the area is already fertile soil as many have heard of the Christian teachings already promoted by the Western missionaries, and as such, they are able to convert and baptize many. They travel and preach northwest through the White Taiyi village, and then go all the way to Guangxi province by foot to the village of Sugu in Guiping County, to see distant Hakka relatives. On their way, they encounter a Han Chinese who acts as a school teacher for the children of the Miao tribes people. 
he too is converted and promises to educate the Miao children with Hong's own teachings. Hong, still relying on Liang Yafar's tracts, decides it more expedient to write his own exhortations and spends months in the village of Sigu writing them. He makes verses made up of seven simple characters with the aim of making them easy to remember for those who cannot read or write, combining them with historical Chinese epithets to make the teachings more familiar to the villagers who read them. His improvised religious sermons start to become more formalized over time and more and more curious villagers would come to listen to what he has to say and participate in his rituals. One of his staple prayers would read, I earnestly pray to the Heavenly Father and Great God to bestow upon me constantly His Holy Spirit to change my wicked heart and never allow the demon devils to deceive me. Constantly look after me and never permit the demon devils to harm me. And within a few months, Hong has converted almost a hundred people. Feng Yunshan temporarily splits off from Hong and goes deeper into the rural territory of Guangxi far from the centers of Confucian education and influence. He takes with him Hong's preaching style and goes into the secluded villages preaching of Hong's dream and his relationship to Jesus. His tour takes him to all the secluded villages of Thistle Mountain by the lower foothills dominating northern Guanxi, all of which are dirt poor. For instance, many of these initial converts were coal miners who were so poverty stricken that they ate their own coal. You might ask, well, how is that even possible? Well, rural Guanxi in the 18th century was a kind of hell on earth. If the poverty wasn't bad enough, people's lives were made worse by the banditry that had existed there due to the fact that its dense forests and mountains provide any fugitive from the law the ability to simply vanish. The problem got even worse when the British, upon capturing Hong Kong, endeavoured to free the water routes of pirates and after devastating the legendary pirate fleets that roamed the South China Sea, the remaining pirates fled inland along the Xi River into Guangxi. If the problem of pirates weren't bad enough, the pirates brought with them a new menace, triads. What are known as triads are Chinese mafia-like organizations who essentially act as the criminal branch of a powerful secret society known as the Heaven and Earth Society. This is the same secret society I mentioned earlier. Many are compelled to join the triads for various reasons. For example, most villagers are daily robbed and threatened with violence by bandits claiming affiliation with the triads, and so joining them would not only stop them from being robbed, but also afford them their protection. Almost all of the triad and secret society members belong to the Hakka people, so to add this to the mix is the ethnic tensions felt between the Han Chinese and the Hakka people who felt they brought crime to the area, making feuds between the two people a standard feature of Guangxi life. Revenge against those who speak the Hakka tongue becomes a popular slogan among Han Chinese families and as a response, Hakka farmers take weapons to work and rally in big family groups when the alarm is given. With these surging ethnic tensions, triad syndicates running rampant, pirates choking the riverways, secret societies fomenting rebellion and bitter poverty, local officials were powerless to do anything as many of them had been swallowed up by their own problems, mainly being indebted to or being in league with secret society organizations. For the beleaguered Hakka in this tense and hellish environment, Hong's message of salvation had a special resonance. Feng Yushan's great success in converting the villages of Thistle Mountain allows them to form their first base as they label themselves the God-Worshipping Society. The preaching of Feng Yunshan has deeper appeal when believers are given a promise of solidarity from the threatening forces from all around. Hong and Feng continue their writings and interpretation of Hong's dream, bolstered by the newfound knowledge of the Bible thanks to the new translations that have come out by the missionary Karl Gutzlaff. Reading Gutzlaff's translation of Exodus, I am the Lord of all and the Supreme God. You people must on no account set up images of things in heaven above or on earth below, or kneel down and worship them. Hong starts to pay more attention for the need to banish idols, and despite having originally used Confucian epithets to expand his Christian teachings, Hong turns sharply to demonize Confucianism. He would then rewrite the vision he had to include Confucius. Hong writes, The one true God 
praises both the Old Testament and the New Testament as being pure and without error. By contrast, all Confucian books are condemned by God for their numerous errors and faults and are accused of bearing the ultimate guilt for inciting the demons to do wrong. Confucius has muddled and confused the people of China so that his reputation exceeded the true God of the land. Hong would then claim that Jesus himself would add to the criticism, that Confucius called harm to my own younger brother, Hong Shouquan, possibly because Hong had failed the Confucian-based imperial examinations. Quote, Confucius, seeing that everyone in the high heaven pronounced him guilty, secretly fled down from the heaven, hoping to join up with the leader of the demon devils. The heavenly father, the supreme lord and great god, thereupon dispatched Hong Shou Chuan and a host of other angels to pursue Confucius and to bring him bound and tied before the heavenly father. The heavenly father, in great anger, ordered the angels to flog him. Confucius knelt before the heavenly elder brother, Christ, and repeatedly begged to be spared. Confucius was given many lashes and his pitiful pleas were unceasing. Then the heavenly father, the supreme lord and great god, considering that the meritorious achievements of Confucius compensated for his deficiencies, granted that he be permitted to partake of the good fortune of heaven, but he never again be allowed to go down to earth." End quote. Hong and Feng relocate to a village even deeper in the mountains, and here they hear about an idol worshipped by the locals named King Gan. Gan was a local person who generations ago had asked the magician where the perfect spot for he and his descendants should be buried when they die. He was told of the perfect spot, but said that he needed to sanctify the spot with a bloody ritual. So Gan sacrificed his own mother on the spot, and when he himself died, he was buried there. Ever since then, there were supernatural events that occurred in that spot where he was buried and so the locals built a shrine to him and christened him King Gan. Apparently he caused illness for the villagers in the area and they had to sacrifice a pig to him to receive his protection or gain his favour. Hearing this enraged Hong, who says this King Gan is quote, clearly a demon devil and my first task is to save the people of the community. And together with his supporters, they go up to the shrine and shout abuse at it hurling rocks and hitting it with bamboo poles as they do so. He then puts the idol on trial and reads out on scroll before everyone the 10 counts of immorality King Gan has been guilty of. When King Gan has been sentenced, he proclaims to the idol, Now do you recognize me, the ruler? If you do recognize me, then straight away you had best go back down to hell. And with the help of his supporters, the fanatical mob pulls down the statue, stomp on its head, dig out its eyes, break off its arms in a fanatical fashion. In its place, he writes a manifesto in defiance of the demon devil, King Gan, which he places on the wall of the shrine, signing his name, Taiping Heavenly King. This event does much to enhance Hong's reputation as a great spiritual leader amongst the locals. Hong and Feng are joined by two more individuals who would become central to the god-worshipping movement. One is a charcoal burner named Yang Shouqing, who was drawn to the god-worshippers due to his poverty, and would be discovered that Yang has a special ability of entering into trance-like states and is able to channel the voice of God. It is likely that Yang was an epileptic, and what he was experiencing was seizures. But through his religious fits, Hong would supposedly receive direct commands from God himself. The second was Xiao Chao Gui, who has a similar condition to Yang's, but instead is able to channel the voice of Jesus Christ. Xiao Chao Gui and Yang Shouqing would become staples in this growing God-worshipping society, bringing various messages to Hong from God while singing songs and poems supposedly composed by God and Jesus in heaven. Xiao Chao Gui tells Hong of all the events that have taken place in heaven since he left 11 years earlier, saying that his wife, first chief of the moon and his sons miss him very much, and how God and his wife, Jesus and his wife, along with Hong's own wife, all of them have a shared extended family. The god worshippers of Thistle Mountain are all inundated with visions, dreams, and trances during these times, and are all recorded as part of the law of the Taiping religion. One vision by one of the god worshippers reads, 
a martial host descended from heaven and fights the bandits who plague Sigu village. Angels dressed in yellow defend Hong from demons carrying muskets and Hong's heavenly wife, the first chief of the moon, saves him from mortal danger. While Sitching state officials see the god worshippers as just a religious organization and leave them alone, the vast network of tried groups linked to the heaven and earth societies and the influx of pirates fleeing the British would draw the attention of the Qing court to their chaotic realm of Guangxi province. But despite this apathy from the Qing, the small band of god worshippers couldn't control their own fanaticism and the desire to destroy statues and Confucian shrines would get the better of them. When two god worshippers were caught vandalizing a shrine, they were imprisoned and due to the poor conditions of their cells, they both died. This was the decisive factor that brought the god worshippers into a formal anti-government stance. It's at this point Hong officially declares it is the Manchu authorities themselves who are the demon devils and calls for their extermination. Hong declares to all that, quote, Those who believe not in the true doctrine of God and Jesus, though they be old acquaintances, are still no friends of mine, but they are demons. Those who worship them are the slaves of the demon devils, and at the day of their death, their devil masters will drag them away." Unquote. The belief that the Chinese had been enslaved by the devil Manchus was shared by the secret societies scattered throughout Guangxi, and in them, many of these secret society members would resonate with the words of Hong. However, unlike the secret societies who wanted to restore the Ming Dynasty, Hong started to proclaim that it was time for a new kingdom. A heavenly kingdom. A kingdom that would bring on a time of great peace. A Taiping Tian Guo. The god worshippers had already organized themselves into militias to protect their members from unwanted criminal threats in the area, but now they've become decidedly more militaristic. Now utterly convinced that the world around them is filled with a spawn of hell, the fanatics make guerrilla attacks on unsuspecting Qing, or should I say, demon officers, and now it is game on. Hong officially renames himself the King of Great Peace, the Taiping King. With the God Worshipping Society now representing a better alternative to joining the Triads, thousands of uprooted peasants join them en masse to receive salvation and their protection. The new recruits are first indoctrinated in a new Taiping religion. They then partake in mass baptism events, and then they are placed into army units where they work on the fertile land to produce food and train for battle. However, as times worsen, the ranks swell with the uninitiated, and for the leaders of the god worshippers, the biggest concern is with maintaining the integrity of their religion with so many new uninitiated recruits. They decide the easiest way would be to separate men and women in the interests of decency and common good. The leadership originally made hints for the followers to do this, but in the end, this suggestion be upgraded into law, and ultimately all acts of sex become punishable by death, even between husband and wife. With the family separated from each other, the Taiping were able to form a Spartan-like order with the individuals owing allegiance to their unit instead of their own family. This would allow for the creation of female army units, a phenomenon made possible by the fact that the gross huck women didn't bind their feet. With the men and women forcefully separated, the Taiping become noted for the high levels of discipline and absolute devotion to the cult. By July of 1850, Hong starts to wear a yellow robe, a sacred color banned for everyone but the emperor himself. Jesus, through the voice of Xiao Chao Gui, would tell Hong, quote, Fight for heaven, take responsibility for all the rivers and mountains, show the world the true laws of God the Father, to realize God has given him full authority to rule his kingdom. On October 29, with the financial aid of wealthy recruits, Hong secretly buys up gunpowder in bulk, and in the god-worshipping town of Jintian, there is a secret operation making simple arms and hiding them in the nearby ponds. Despite having no military experience, Feng Yunshan would head the military operations based purely on the military theory he had read in the ancient books of war. One of these books was an ancient codec called The Rites of Zhou, written in the 2nd century BC, and from it he learned an entire system of governing the military, from how to divide the rank and file, to learning a complex system of communication using banner movements, gongs and code words for, to direct their assaults. 
In preparation for conflict, the god worshippers would make it a daily ritual to recite the Ten Commandments, and from this point on, the Ten Commandments would become a basis for all the rules governing their daily lives. Thousands of new Hakka recruits would join, now driven by the increasing ethnic violence towards them and the triads making life miserable for the average person. But ironically, at the same time, the god worshippers would be inundated with a huge influx of triad members coming to join their ranks due to the massive coordinated campaign against them coming to full swing by the Qing government. It wasn't only triads though, even pirates would join the growing ranks of the Taiping due to the government crackdown on them also. One of these pirate leaders was the notorious Big Head Yang, an infamous half-Portuguese pirate from Macau. With huge Qing forces now stationed in the Guangxi to settle the threat from the pirates and the triads, and the god worshippers having struck first blood, the Qing finally coordinated against them. Originally, just a small expeditionary force to Jintian village to feel out the enemy. Misunderestimating the enemy, however, as a disorganized group of bandits, the fanatical but well-disciplined god worshippers descend on the Qing soldiers and annihilate them. The victorious god worshippers celebrate their first victory by executing their first demon, a deputy police magistrate that had come with the small Qing force. The god worshippers, along with their new triad and pirate recruits, total 10,000 soldiers. They march a mile east of Jintian and take up three coordinated defensive positions in a wide arc between the Qing forces and Jintian. Manchu Colonel Ikendabu. He tries to force his way through the center of the Taiping line, but Xiao and Yang close in from the flanks, severing Ikendabu from his rear guard and trapping him in, forcing the Qing forces to rout. Reinforcements from Guiping are sent, but they are also beaten back, and the remaining Qing troops pull back across the river. After the victory, massive quarrels erupt amongst the new recruits over the excess discipline and the disallowance of looting of their defeated enemies. Considering many of these new recruits are ex-criminals, many feel their grievances are justified and hope to get some kind of material reward for their efforts on the battlefield. For the many self-serving recruits who hope to gain something, this is too much to bear and many leave, including many secret society members. But with the army essentially purged of its weak elements, what's left is a die-hard corps who seek no reward but to simply obey the command of the Taiping King and to complete their quest to exterminate the demon devils once and for all. Despite their victory, the Qing army regroups and being significantly more numerous and well armed than the god worshippers, the god worshippers are forced to move to the more prosperous market town of Jenko, 50 miles to the east, which acts as the base for the pirate Big Head Yang's operations. Along with Big Head Yang is another major upcoming leader, Lord Dagong also a pirate and a major leader of the Heaven and Earth Secret Society who recently converted to the Taiping religion. He proves himself to be indispensable in organizing waterborne operations and together with Big Head Yang, they developed the waterborne forces of the god worshippers into a formidable fighting force. The Qing, with 10,000 men, won't allow the god worshippers to become entrenched at Genko and after three weeks are finally able to push them out. The god worshipper leaders are able to slip out in the middle of the night while their forces left behind are slaughtered by the Qing. Despite this major setback, Hong makes it official. Without pomp or fanfare, Hong declared to his close leadership circle the formal existence of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom in the spring of 1851, declaring the reset of history to year one. From now on, the god worshippers will be referred to as the Taiping. On this day, Jesus, through one of Xiao Chaogui's epileptic revelations, would speak of the growing complexity of the heavenly kingdom now on earth and his desire to discipline those who disobey the heavenly commandments. Jesus would say, quote, This enterprise is directed by heaven, not by men. It is too difficult to be handled by men alone. Trust completely in your heavenly father and heavenly brother. They will take charge of everything, so you need not worry or be nervous. In the past, I try to save as many mortals as possible from among those who are threatened with destruction by demons. Now we have so many followers of God, what should you fear? Those who betray God won't be able to escape the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Brother's punishment. If we wish to have you live, you will live. If we want you to perish, you will die." End quote. Following this statement, Jesus gives a long list of typing leaders who are quote, taken to heaven and initiated into the mysteries. 
They are then told by Jesus that disobeying a military order is now the same as disobeying God and it gives each commander the authority to kill any rebel before reporting them to higher authorities. The authoritarian nature of the cult becomes even more brutal with lapses in military discipline being treated as crimes against God and crimes against God being met with military discipline. Even failing to show up on time to religious rituals result in a public beating. A God-worshipping convert named Ling Shiba, a Guangdong native from Yixin, becomes one of the prominent fanaticals that would support Hong. He would convert 3,000 people and long before Hong had started conflict with the Qing, he had already been stockpiling gunpowder and training militia and manufacturing arms. Now in mid-1851, with 3,000 of Ling's troops holding Yulin, move north to link up with Hong's forces, but the Qing concentrate their forces to prevent them from converging. But wouldn't you know it, key in the Qing's defense is Big Head Yang, who decides to turn coat and help the Qing in exchange for amnesty and a bribe. That's what you get for making a pirate named Big Head Yang a general in your army. Yang's pirates prevent Hong from crossing the Qian River, and as such they are both pushed back and Ling loses Yu Lin. To strengthen the morale of his defeated soldiers, he proclaims to his followers to shed their doubts and fears and to fix their sights on the coming earthly paradise, the heavenly kingdom, the Tian Guo. Here, the god worshippers would receive rewards beyond their expectation. Hong insinuates in his speech that the Taiping may soon have a permanent base in which they and their families can live in eternal peace and paradise. Just as God led the Israelites through the Sinai, so too will God lead them to the promised land, the New Jerusalem. During these troubled times, these faux Israelites, running from Qing armies, would ruthlessly hunt down the heretics and deniers in their own ranks with public executions awaiting those who are convicted and hung around the neck will be a placard reading, Jesus, our elder brother, showed the treacherous heart of this demon follower. Despite the Thistle Mountain role as the incubator of the whole Taiping movement, it's not the place to remain if they are to survive as Qing troops encircle on their position. And although there is no indication of where this earthly paradise lay, they make a breakout to the northeast. The fast, disciplined and coordinated Taiping leave the Qing troops off balance, but as they burst from their womb at Thistle Mountain, their reputation for ruthlessness starts to set in as they burn villages that they stay in, implementing a scorched earth policy and picking every morsel of grain from the countryside, leaving nothing for the locals and the pursuing Qing troops. The vanguard land forces are led by Xiao Chaogui and 18-year-old military prodigy Shi Da Kai, while Lord Da Gang moves up from the river until they arrive at the stoutly walled city of Yong'an, 60 miles north of Thistle Mountain. Unable to determine the direction of the agile Taiping army, the Qing forces fall well behind and are unable to stop their advance. The Taiping were not prepared with equipment to mount a siege on a walled city, but simply using random items they found along their journey, the Taiping would use their ingenuity to deadly effect. They would tie buckets filled with stones to their horses and have them gallop around the walls, exaggerating their real numbers and shattering the nerves of the defenders. Then during night time, the soldiers would light fireworks throughout the night over the city giving them nights of sleeplessness and demoralizing their opponents. Then after many days of this demoralization, the Taiping set their few cannons on the east gate whilst ladders were set to the wall. The invaders would protect their ascent up the wall with coffins attached to poles. After many days of this unconventional war, the first waves of troops successfully scaled the walls and entered the city and finally, 14 long years after Hong's first celestial battle with the demon devils in heaven, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom finally acquired the first earthly city. That's all for this part guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, give a like and to see part 2, make sure to subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace.